Chapter 7, Application of Vectors, by Abu, Amar, and Rishav. Now I know we're all eager to learn some calculus, but first, let me take a selfie. Drop it! So today we will be covering chapter 7, application of vectors. So our first topic is vectors as forces. What is a force? Force is something that changes or tend to change the state of a rest or uniform motion. It is something that either pushes or pulls an object. It is a vector quantity because it has both a magnitude and a direction. The unit of force is Newton and it is defined as mass time acceleration due to gravity. For example, force exerted on a 2 kg mass on Earth is 9.8 meters per second which is acceleration due to gravity multiplied by 2 kg. So the answer is 19.6 newton. The next thing we're going to talk about is resultant or sum. A single force acting on an object is called resultant or sum. It is a combination of individual forces with the combined effect of all the forces acting on the object and the process of finding resultant is called composition of forces. Equilibrium. Equilibrium is basically a single force that is opposite of resultant. So in this following example, there is two forces acting on an object. One is 6 newton and the other one is 2 newton. So to find the resultant, since they are in the same direction, we are going to add them up. So we get 8 newton and the equilibrium to this force is going to be the same in magnitude but opposite in direction. So let's do an example together. A 300 newton force is exerted on a rope to pull a sledge. It makes a 30 degree angle with the horizontal. So find the forces that pull the sledge forward and tend to lift the sledge up. So we're going to start out by drawing a vector diagram. So BC in this diagram is horizontal component and BA is a vertical component. So to find BC, we're going to use Sokotoa. So if you can see BC equals to 300 multiplied by cos 30. And three when you multiply them together, you're going to get 259.81 newtons. And for BA, it's going to be 300 multiplied by sine 30 and you're going to get 150 newtons. So these are the forces that are tend to moving the sledge upwards and in forward direction. Velocity. It is a vector component because it contains both a magnitude and a direction. And when you have multiple velocity, you can combine them up and which will result in a resultant velocity. So in this next example, we have an airplane heading south has an airspeed of 813 km per hour and it encounters a wind from east at 212 km per hour. So we are asked to find how long does it take for the airplane to travel 1765 km. In order to do that, we're going to start up by drawing a vector diagram. So in this following diagram, the two red arrows indicates the wind and airplane, the speed of airplane. So we find the resultant speed of airplane, which is the blue line. So e square plus b square equals to c square. So 813 square plus 212 square equals to v square. So when you solve for v, you're going to get 840.19 kilometers per hour. So now we have the speed. We have to find how long does it take.
Today I'm going to be talking about 7.3, the dot product of two geometric vectors. So as we know, vectors are scalar, and dot products can either be positive, negative, or zero depending upon the size. As we can see here, vector AC and vector AB. Vector AC times vector AB equals the magnitude of vector AC times the magnitude of vector, vector AB cos theta. Zero being less than or equal to theta which is less than or equal to 180 degrees. Theta has to be between 0 degrees to 180 degrees for the dot product to be calculated. For example 1, the magnitude of A equals 3, the magnitude of B equals 5, and cos equals 120 degrees. So we sub in these values. A times B equals the magnitude of A, which is 3, times the magnitude of, five, of B, which is 5, cos 120 degrees, and this would give us a value of negative 7.5. Then we would find the magnitude of a squared, so we would put the value of negative 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 4 squared, and we'd get the value of 21, in which we would then have to square root the value of 21 to find the magnitude of a, since it's squared. Then we find the magnitude of b squared, which is 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 3 squared, which equals 34, and since it's b squared, we, we would have to find the square root to find the magnitude of b, which would be the square root of 34. Then we would use cos theta equals vector a times vector b divided by the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b. Theta would then equal 17 that we found earlier in part a divided by the square root of 21 times square root of 34. We would get a value of 0 0.6362 of cos theta. Then we would have to inverse that value of theta. So cos to the power of negative 1, the value of 0 0.6362, and theta would then be 50.5 degrees. Alrighty, now it's time for section 7.5, scalar and vector projections. Now, a projection of one vector onto another can be either a scalar or a vector. The difference is that the vector projection has a direction, whereas a scalar projection only has a magnitude. Now, in order to determine the scalar projection of A onto B, you would do the dot product of A and B divided by the magnitude of the vector B. This would also be equal to the magnitude of vector A cos theta, where theta is the angle between A and B. Now, vector projection is very similar to scalar projection, the only difference being that you take the scalar projection equation and you multiply it by a unit vector in the direction of vector B for the vector projection of A onto B. A final topic to end on is the direction cosines. Basically, the direction cosines are the angles that a vector makes with the x, y, and z axis. Of course, all these axes are positive, and the angles can be given by the following equations. As you can see, these equations are all very similar. The only thing that changes is the component that you are solving for. So if you'd like to solve for the angle that this vector makes with the x-axis, you'd use the x-component to solve for it. And so on for the other two axes. Moving forward, we move on to 7.6, the cross product of two vectors. To start off with, it's very important to remember that the cross product is not the same as the dot product, and you will get different results. Now, in order to get the answer to the cross product, you will have to solve the matrix. Start by having two vectors. A and B, which have the components X, Y, and Z. Now continue on by breaking those two vectors, A and B, into their I, J, and K components. In order to solve the matrix for one of the components, like I, you would block out the I column, and you would do the cross product between the remaining two columns, which is J and K. You'd end up with the result of Y1 times Z2 minus Z1 times Y2, which would be the I component. The same exact rule can be applied to the K column, 
However, the J column is a bit different as you have to add a negative sign at the beginning. of. Now that you've solved the matrix for the individual components, you can combine them all together and create a formula that will give you the solution to the cross product between any two vectors, A and B. So we end off with a very nice formula. That's it. Simple as that. Now vector A cross vector B is equal to the magnitude of vector A times magnitude of vector B times sine theta, with theta being the angle between the two vectors. Now although the dot product of A and B can be interchanged and still get you the same value, the vectors of A cross B cannot be interchanged without changing a negative sign on one of them, as it will get you different results. Alrighty, sweet, we're almost at the end. 7.7, .7, application of the dot and cross product. One of the main applications is for work, which is force dot displacement. Now the cross product is very useful for determining the area of a parallelogram or a triangle with sides of vector A and B. The area of a parallelogram with vector A and B is its sides is the magnitude of the cross product between A and B, and the area of a triangle with vectors A and B is its side is the magnitude of the cross product of A and B divided by 2. Alrighty, now it's time for an example to test our strength. Gandalf the Grey started in the forest of Mirkwood at a point with coordinates 2 and negative 3, and arrived in the Iron Hills at the point with coordinates 4 and 0. If he began walking in the direction of the vector v is equal to 5i plus 1j, and changes direction only once, when he turns at a right angle, what are the coordinates of the point where he makes the turn? Well, to start off, we're just going to let point A be 2 and negative 3, and let point B be 4 and 0. Now we're going to have that third point M, where we don't know where it is, but it's the point where he makes the turn. So we're going to label this one as X and Y. He starts at point A, and he uses the vector 5i plus 1j to get to point M. This means that we can have a vector AM which is equal to 5 and 1. But we have to multiply this by k because we don't know how far or how short this distance is. Now from point M to point B, we need one more vector. We're going to need to use the coordinates that we got for both of them. So we find that the vector BM is equal to x minus 4 and y minus 0. So it's x minus 4. And why? Now it says that he makes a right turn, which is a complete right angle at 90 degrees, meaning that the dot product between the vector AM and BM is going to be equal to zero. Now by determining the dot product between the vector AM and BM, we get 5k times x minus 4 plus yk is equal to zero. We can factor out k, get rid of it, move y to the other side and then get rid of the negative on the y, making it y is equal to negative 5x plus 20, and that will be the first equation required to solve the two unknown variables. Now for the second equation, we're going to create an equation of a circle that has the diameter a to b. And to start off with, we're going to have to find the distance between the point a and b. Let's call this d for diameter. Now, we would just simply use the distance formula and get a quick answer, which is the root of 13. Now, using this, we plug it back into the grade 10 equation of a circle, and we divide the diameter by 2. So, radius squared is equal to x minus a squared plus y minus b squared. Now, you're probably wondering, what's a and b? Well, a and b are the x and y components of the radius in a circle. And so to do that, you would just add the points B and A to each other, and you would divide it by 2. For both the X and the Y component, we find out that it's 3 for the X component and negative 1.5 for the Y component. Continuing on, we take the first equation and sub it into Y in the second equation, and we expand the brackets to get a quadratic formula. Solving the quadratic formula gives...
gives you two roots, x is equal to 4 and x is equal to 9 over 2. We cannot use x equal to 4, however, because that is already one of the points, and that is not acceptable. And so we cancel that one out, and we use 9 over 2. And to finally conclude, what happens is that you take the x is equal to 9 over 2, you sub it back into the original equation to solve for y. And you get y is equal to negative 5 over 2. That is the point. Thank you very much. Hopefully you learned something. You guys all deserve lollipops for sitting painfully through all of this. And I think I'm going to end it off with another selfie.